Okay, there we go. I'll start recording the the class. I don't know if anybody else will show up. Nobody showed up for the first two. <laughs> but um, we covered triggers this past week. And we had a quiz. Did you do the quiz? Yes, I did. I did it a day late because I forgot about it, but I did it. Okay. Yeah, I was like the one I checked on Wednesday, there was one person that had finished it. I wasn't sure if anybody else had done it yet or not. I haven't checked it this morning. Okay. Uh, so we have a final coming up on someday. I think I just made someday. <laughs> yeah, someday. Your finals here. I think that made your screen gray. I believe. Is that what happened? It just went gray? Um, no, I still see, move your mouse around because I, I still see uh, DB Forge Studio. Okay, maybe it's... Maybe it's frozen. It's probably frozen. I think when it records, it's just gray because uh, I got another window up over it right now. Okay. Um, I'm not looking for, so I'm looking at the right, it says May 15th, that's not right. Um, yeah, I need to definitely get the final fixed up. So... Just uh, let me know when you don't want to hear my beautiful voice anymore for the recording. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I'm showing the final on Friday the 15th, that is not correct. <laughs> School is grades are due on the 12th, I think. Well, that was good to look at. Hmm. So if you go on the main website, go to degree options and academic calendar, spend out the academic calendar for spring and go to the bottom, it'll have the grade or the final, or final exam. You really need to talk to your professors to see. It looks like our final is supposed to be May 11th. Okay. No oh, problem. Thursday. Hmm. Yep. Let me go edit that final here. Edit settings. Eleven. Eight a.m. to nine fifty a.m. This shouldn't change the calendar up. I'll send out a notification that has changed. Now it should send out an email. 
I believe. I'll give it a look. And that puts it on the calendar correctly. set the availability date on it. So that should allow me to go ahead and put the password up it because you shouldn't be able to access it until until the time period. So did you get an email? Um, haven't gotten anything yet. I'm hoping it sends those notifications out. I put a little checkbox like notify the user. So that's the only way it may do that. Maybe it does it once a day or something. I don't know. Sure. They're usually, I feel like it's usually legs behind a couple hours. Um, and I know that I get a daily notification mm -hmm. so that at the end of the day, that if there are notifications from teachers or users or classmates, I get that all in one giant email at the end of the day. So yep. that could do it. Okay, well, if you go to the Canvas, look under database technology in week 16, it should now show the date correctly. It should show you the password to the final and when to jump in and take it. Yep, it's updated on my end. Cool. Definitely needed that out there. Okay, so I wanted to go over a trigger that used both old and new data and didn't have a whole lot to, to think about. Let's see, old and new data. So we created a playlist on, or a trigger on playlist. I don't think we've done anything on the genre table. So that'd probably be a good one to, to create a trigger on that an update trigger. So I wanted to show that off. So we want to update genre. And if you run update, that means you're going to change data in one table. Let's go ahead and look at it. Select star from genre so we have all of this in here and if we wanted to update anything like we needed to we noticed a misspelling somewhere 
So we'll probably pick on opera and then spell it Oprah or something like that. <laughs> but I'm gonna update this and change that. You have the old data, opera, and you have the new data, um, Oprah. So, let's build a trigger for that. We'll use new and old. Let's look at what an update statement would look like first. I'm gonna kind of do the last, last build. So if I wanna do update, um, let's see, is it update table? And let this table not look right. Just update genre, maybe just update genre. So we're going to update genre. We're going to set name equal to I don't even know, we'll misspell it, O-R-P-A. And then we'll narrow this down so it doesn't change everything to where genre ID is equal to 25. So I'm not going to execute that right now. I'm just going to going to have that created so we can kind of talk about that. So if this is run, the new data is ORPA, OPRA, and the old data is actual opera down here. So if that runs, we want an I want a update trigger. It's going to take maybe what do we want to do? Do we want to take the new data and put it somewhere else? Or do we want to take the old data and put it somewhere else? So I think what we may want to do is go ahead and let the new data pass through and update this table and take the old data and put it into into a new a new table. So let's create a new table first that mimics the genre table. We'll just go Archive genre or archiving the old information that was changed. So I'll name it like that. You can name it anything you want. We'll mimic the columns. It's integer and name is a var care. It's probably 120. The others have been, yep, it's 120. We run this. Make sure it runs, do a refresh. So the, the table is created. 
So now I have a place to put old data. So in the way that Postgres does, I guess you've kind of noticed I've put out there a couple links that went beyond what the book covers. And hopefully y'all looked at those, looked at the other YouTubes that I put out showing that you normally create a function for Postgres. I think you tried to do the book way in turn in, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yep. Yeah. Did it work on your end? Um, no. <laughs> yeah, I copied the code and tried to run it, and I'm like, I, it looks correct the way that you would do it in the SQL standard, but I don't think Postgres actually does that. Maybe the newer version, like 12, may take all of those, but. I'm on my PG admin that I'm using is on Postgres 12 and it didn't even work on there. So. Mm. Well, what about the back end though? What version do you have? Um, I believe it's 12. Okay, so you went and installed? Because I don't think Portable has 12 out the last I looked. I couldn't, I couldn't get Portable to work for whatever reason, so I just said screw it and did PG admin. Um, 12. Ah, okay. Cool. I think create procedure works in 12, what I was reading, but. So for, for uh, triggers, you got to create a function, a trigger function for it to run. You can't actually create the way it shows in the book. So we create a function and we give it a name, something archive genre, sure. And functions always need to return or you got to tell what, what type of function is it? So this is declaring the function type right here. The returns is plural. So it returns what? In our case, it returns a trigger. So this specifies the type of function it is, that it's a trigger function and not some other type. <clears throat> and we'll put, I'm not gonna declare any true variable name. I'll just use the dollar signs there. You have a begin and you also have an end. It ends in a semicolon. <clears throat> you have the closing variable name and then the language. And this is Postgres specific, it's procedural logic. Uh, Postgres SQL. Of course, if you run any other database vendor stuff, you'll have to figure out, you know, what do you have to encode down here and read up their specifics. So in between the begin and end is what you want, what SQL commands that you would actually execute. So I want to take the old data and it deals by rows. So I want to, yeah, I want to take the old data and I want to put it into archive genre. So we haven't dealt with old data yet. I've only dealt with new, but I'll do an insert statement into the archive genre table. And I'm gonna specify the column headings, just good coding practices. We don't have to, 
genre ID and name, but it's best to write it like that. And an insert also includes the values. And the values to be inserted. So we've been doing new, but this time I want to put in the old. So remember, this is dealing with the row. So when we select star from genre, we've seen that the last row had the genre ID, which is 25. So I want that value. So I'm going to specify the old rows genre ID and the old rows spelling of opera. So I specify the, the column headings here, genre ID in that last row there on select star from genre has 25 in it and the name column has opera. So those values are gonna be inserted into archive genre. So our first old data. And then the function, we typically, well, we have to return something. You return a single thing. What do we want to return? If we return old information, then the old would come out and it wouldn't really change. <clears throat> so we want to return new. We want to return to OPRA, the opera right here. So I'm returning new because when I run this statement, this is the new information. We're going to make it call a, tr call a trigger. The trigger is going to take the old information, dump it into archive genre, and then once the trigger is done, what do you want to do with that? Old, what, what do you want to do with the new information? <clears throat> we don't return it. It just disappears and, and this never finishes. The new information never gets put into the genre table. So we want to return it to this statement so it'll continue. <clears throat> I think we've got all the semicolons in the right place. That's a SQL statement. Returning news is a statement. Ending is a statement. So I should be able to execute this. Language does not exist. What? Procedural logic PL. Postgres P. That's Q. How about a type of Q? Okay, now it's actually, now it worked. So that got created into the system. Should show up as a trigger function. Refresh. Um, yeah, yeah, AR genre. Yep, yep, it did. So it showed up into that trigger function because it retur returns as trigger. Okay. So now we need to apply the trigger to the table, to the genre table. Why do we apply it to the genre table? Because when we're updating, what are we updating? We're updating the genre table. That's when we want the trigger to be pulled and fire off this function 
to execute these commands. So we got to apply the uh, the trigger to the genre table. So when when this statement is sent to it, if the trigger is applied to the table, it's ran. And when do we want it to run? We want it to run before or after. We can't do instead of. If you read in the book, instead of is only for views. So we want this to run before or after. What do you think, Adam? After? Question mark. <laughs> Why after? Don't put me on the spot. Not enough cough. <laughs> so if we do it after, that means that this statement will complete first before it runs this code. Oh, so we definitely want before then. So if it ran after, then this misspelling would be put into the name field. And then when this ran, I'm thinking that it would pull the information out of the, the genre. And the update, I'm not sure that it would actually, actually matter, but we might lose that. There's a possibility we could lose that old data. So I'd want to run it before. I'd want the old data to be taken out and put into the archive before this finished is my thinking. So I think I want to run it before. So create trigger. I have to give it a name. What do we want to name it? Trigger genre, maybe. Something like that, sounds good. So oh, before, before what? What do we put after before? <laughs> What's your thoughts? Hmm. Um, before we do any sort of updating, right? Yep, so it's before update. So before an update statement runs, then what? Before an update statement runs on the table. The genre table. Yep. So we're creating a trigger. We're setting the trigger uh, before update on the genre table. So and if an update statement runs on genre table, this trigger is going to be run. And then we want it to be for each row. We want it to execute. All the prisoners. No, just kidding. I want to text. And the procedure is the function up here that we created. Well, they call it a procedure and not a function. Um, they just are, because really it's, it's kind of acting as a procedure where you just run in a set of SQL code a little bit more than what a function does. It's the way Postgres does it. Procedures and functions are kind of combined into one, one style. So create the trigger. 
before and we're creating a before update trigger on the genre table each row that's updated is going to execute the procedure so if this if you didn't put the where in there it would run this as many times as there are rows in the table so for every single row that is changed with the update statement this is going to be fired off so execute selection I have a success and all the other times that disappeared it didn't this time so I hit the little close okay cool I'm going to run this update one row was affected Did the trigger work? How do we find out? Select star from genre. And select star from, we named it archive. So if we look at the genre table, opera spelled wrong. If we look at the archives table, then opera is spelled correctly. Hmm. So Opera should have been put into your other table. I can allow you to screen share. See, I have to stop sharing and you can share your, your PG screen. So I'll set it up there. So yeah, you can share your screen. We can look, see maybe why yours didn't work. Don't no, forget your mic's still muted. All right, so the genre select statement works. We see opera. Yep. Okay. There's nothing in the archive. Um, I did run the update, I updated one. Yep. Still not there. Hmm. Okay, so we created a table archive, uh, John Raji integer, we have our care 120, it looks good, create function, turns us trigger, begin insert into archive, genre, scroll up a little bit, right there. I'm just making sure all the letters are are the same. Sure. Genre ID name. Values. Old. Genre ID. Old name. You return new, you end. Hmm. <clears throat> that looks okay. Scroll down a little bit. My screen like super small for you? No. No, okay. No, it's full screen. Hmm. 
Hmm. <clears throat> okay, scroll up a little bit. So I'm just comparing all the, make sure there's nothing look transposed. Looks like that should run. I don't see anything. There's probably one little letter somewhere. <clears throat> it's for each row, yeah. Function. Looks good. And that does show up under trigger functions, right? <clears throat> yep. Hmm. Yep, that ran. Mm. Go run your update statement one more time. Just change your update. And the play run selection and not the whole thing. Sorry, what did you want me to do? I'm trying to think. When you hit play, did it just run it, one selection? It should just run one selection here. If I wanted okay. to run everything, I have to highlight it all, unfortunately. Okay. What's there? Oh, okay. I did absolutely nothing different, and now it's there. The only thing we did was you ran the, the create trigger. That should have go, gave you an error. Maybe you never did the create trigger. It's entirely possible, yeah. Because it okay. should have given you an error that it already existed. If you yep. run it that second time, it didn't give an error. Like I said, not enough coffee <clears throat> yet, so it was probably be, probably the issue. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you. But it's got the old old data in it. <laughs> or the misspelling. Okay. Sure. Hmm. You want me to stop sharing now? Oh wait, no. Let's... I'm not be able to double click and spell that correctly. Can you edit? Oh, add a D. Jeez. Yep. Yeah, add an E in there. Oh. And then, and then go. I don't know if I let you edit directly. It shows a lock on it. This probably means read only. Probably have to use an update statement for it. Uh, <laughs> so just go to your update statement. Test this. What is, where am I? Archive drama? Am I like properties? I was just going to see if it has read only somewhere in here. Security. Nope. Okay. Yeah, you'll have to just change the update up there to archive or copy and paste. Yeah.
Yeah. Cool. Success. Okay. Yep. Now you can stop sharing. And I'll reshare my page. Okay. So now what I was going to show, I was going to do another update. But this time I was going to see that the something that you could do on this is maybe like a rollback and, and also maybe to keep uh, a record of changes of stuff that's happening. We could have added a timestamp column that automatically generated um, timestamps and stuff or dates out there if we wanted. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change this update statement. I'm going to set the name equal to and huh. yeah, I'm going to pull it out of the old with the subquery. I'm going to select name from Bless you. Mm -hmm. It's like name from not sneeze, but archive. Genre. Not sure why it's not seeing that. So select name from archive genre where Genre ID equals 25. Probably don't need a semicolon there. Um, let me make sure that, so that spells opera. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. So something that could be done is pulling the old name out, execute selection. Okay, cool. So if we look at the genre table, it's back fixed. And if I look at this table, it shows both both options in there. Uh, one problem if we made another change in the future, and you try to run something like this up here, there would be three uh, genre IDs of 25, so it would stop working. <clears throat> that subquery wouldn't work past that point. We'd have to figure out a, a new way to keep track of everything. Because if I ran it again, it would get more than one answer and would fail. So an update like this, yeah. If I, so what I'm talking about before, it only gave one answer, but if I run this a second time, it gives two different answers and that can't be used in the update. Alrighty, so what do you think about that? Yeah, pretty nifty, I like it. All right, cool, I'm gonna take a little short break. I'm gonna, uh, I think I'd stop recording. So I probably should capture that into the video. Okay, so cursors in chapter 16. We're not going to have um, 
We're not going to have a quiz or anything over that, but cool. Use cursors. Neat. <clears throat> so I'm going to log in here and see if I can show an example. It's like, what I like to see. When did you make the game? It uses cursors. Um, God, I, prob I probably made the, the database. It's really simple. Uh, probably about a month or so ago. Okay. Um, I'm about to upload a screenshot and just kind of kind of show you what it looks like. I'm going to share. Let's see. That's how you learn this stuff. You know, figure out if you don't have a customer asking for something, you got to figure out something for yourself and creating those little games and things are, are really neat. I got to figure out which. I think that one. Okay, you can see my screen again. I believe let me bring chat back up. Every time I share a new screen, it hides the chat window. Okay, so I gotta find my cursor example. Where did I put my cursor example at? And now I just got to find where I'll put it. <clears throat> That's looking too old. Um, <clears throat> What uh, coding language did you use on top of your database for the game? Python. Python, okay. I thought I used Python 3. I still have Python 27 on there. Python 2.7, let's see. Yeah, there's new, the new Python. So I had Python running, um, but where did I dump my script set? There's an example. And that was done on 1113. I didn't teach. This is probably, I showed a PY. So here's my code. Let me see if this, what this is doing. This may be, maybe dealing a little bit with a cursor. So import uh, a couple of modules. So that information is for importing to make a connection into Postgres. 
Yeah. Python ODBC connection. ODBC is a standard network style connection uh, protocol to be able to connect into a database. So Microsoft has an engine that uh, takes different drivers basically and puts it into the engine so the programs can send us, uh, you know, the bit streams and stuff that are understandable, universal between different uh, database running on a system. So I can use one style interface for, for making the connection back and forth. So you just have to load up the drivers or to be able to make the, the conversion. It's almost kind of like, you know, a French speaker being able to talk to a German speaker and they're using like a universal translator in between them. That's sort of what ODBC is. So it's your front end program can communicate with the back end a little bit easier. So information needed to connect to Postgres. So it created some variables, the server name, the database name, the username to log in, and then then I have a try here. So I'm trying to make a connection on number six and loading up the correct driver that I had installed. I had to go out and download the Postgres driver and install it and look at what the name of it was. And then the variables that feed into this uh, driver is a server. Uh, server database, user ID, password. Password is blank. I'm not sure how that worked without a closing tick mark. Should have been a blank password. Hmm. Nope, that's the closing tick mark for up there. Yep, that's what that was. The whole thing is in close. So that is blank at the end. Because I have open and close. I put the plus on either side right there. So we can pull the information out of these variables. So Python's a little bit a little bit weird. <clears throat> these backslashes are just so you can have multiple lines, make it easier to read. So that connects to the database. We use or the, the login information, and we take that information and run a function to create a cursor, store that as a whole whole thing, the connection and cursor together. And then if we have an error, we create an print out the error message. We put, um, write out an error log. So what did I do down here? Did um, I asked something, converted it all to uppercase apparently. So this here, ask a question, user types in, types in something and hits enter. and then it searches for it. And then the actual cursor you can fetch. Fetch one row at a time, and then you can go through the, the different columns, and print stuff out. So that's a basic cursor that was created. Let me look at your cursor here. We'll share it to the screen. Let me change, new share. Where's the web browser? That one. Maximize that a little bit. Okay, let's look at yours. You blanked out your password. We can't, we can't 
Steal your stuff. Oh, that's no fun. <laughs> So I have two different tables in there, um, mm -hmm. and this. So just a, a preface about what this game is: it's called Escape from Tarkov, and um, you basically go in there as like your personal character, or you can go uh -huh. in there at, as a um, a computer generated character, and you you get guns and stuff like that, and you fight your way through and try and get out with a bunch of loot. Um, being guns, backpacks, uh, grenades, all kinds of things. Well, so it's called, one of my tables is Plut for player loot, and then Sloot for what's called a scav, a computer-generated character. Mm -hmm. And um, then it just asks you various questions and inserts it into the database to kind of keep track of it. It's nothing too terribly complicated, but it's still kind of cool. Yep, well, that's cool. Pretty cool. I got to obviously got to do some updating and make it more awesome, but mm -hmm. I haven't really had time to do so lately. So the main main purpose of cursors in, in the coding language is the language can really just deal with one one piece of information at a time. It doesn't deal very well with an entire table dumped into the application itself. So that's basically what cursors are. So it can only be messing with the line at a time instead of seeing the entire table itself. And that concept was just kind of hard to, to get down, especially in the book. I think he even mentioned in the book, it's cursors are normally coded in an outside language. So just like you had done right there. You didn't create an error log though for yours. It's because there are never any errors in anything I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always perfect. Let me re let's see, where's my other screen again? That one. Yeah. So I'm not sure the colors seem kind of muted, maybe because I'm remoted in, I don't know. Lay in class, we tried different dark themes and seen which one worked better with the projector screen, but projector screen is always different from what you see on the screen. Sounds about right. So yeah, I used, um, I'll probably start and land two using tries and stuff, try and catch exceptions. That's basically what I did here is I tried the connection and then the exception, meaning if an error happened, what do I do? Uh, I logged it. And whatever error was um, found is dumped into the error log. See, that's what any smart developer would do. I just didn't. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a, this is like, I don't know, it's, it's probably still level one developer stuff, but uh, for me, that's like level three, <laughs> putting in try and exceptions. Because <laughs> I don't, this is going into development right here, using a coding language, I'm more of, just a scripting person you write some scripts they don't really interact with the user it does some simple stuff but may do like some simple stuff on tens of thousands of things so <clears throat> it, it doesn't take forever <clears throat> to administer a system with sure so yeah got some crazy development stuff you're in the um, you're not in coding are you um no um, okay i remember what like, like we talked about when i first came back to school here mm -hmm. is that there's gonna hopefully be some kind of like um, degree plan for people like me who have done level two c sharp all of java 
um, all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, if you've done all of that, um, hmm, you'd definitely be a good admin. You're definitely well-rounded into everything. Yeah. That's good to be able to to jump in and then you can make sure you should get hired somewhere because like, oh, you know, a whole bunch of different aspects. We can train you in our specific area if they see that you have good work ethic. That's what they're looking for. A lot of them were like, we need somebody that can learn. We'll train them on stuff. I got a company now, Epic. Uh, they are looking for an internship for coding in APIs and stuff. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Epiconline.com. Oh, God, is that the people that make Fortnite? I doubt it. Okay. <laughs> Epoch, I guess, maybe. It may not be Epic, it may be Epoch. Telling it down here. So this company, And where are they located at? Do you know if this is a paid internship? And they're in West Little Rock. A nightmare. So I, I don't know if it's paid internships. Probably. I don't know how many people he's looking for. Right near the Brad Hendricks Law Firm. Yeah. Oh, Argyle's Carpet. I know exactly where that is. Uh, one of those buildings don't look like they have a whole lot of employees. That's a law firm. That's probably another lawyer. I don't know. Brad Hendricks. Brad Hendricks. Hmm. They may have some a little bit mislabeled. I don't know. How far can I zoom in? Goodness. That's some pretty clear. I think that was taken by a drone or something. I don't think that was satellite. What do you want to bet? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that's some super secret uh, satellite that we have okay. going on. And zoom in on people's faces. Paramount Metal Systems. Hmm. Maybe it's this building here. That could be, I don't know, not a lot of, a little bit of parking places. It don't look like they're wanting to hire lots and lots of people. Of course, they may be working from home. I don't know. That's where they say they are. Looks like to do website scan, venue, management software, marketing packages. So they do 
They help companies get into Google searches and stuff. I think the uh, the one thing that I'm I'm really missing out on in order to be more I guess rounded in all this stuff is JavaScript. I've never ever 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 touched JavaScript ever, so I need to learn that. Or at least yeah, JavaScript is about it. JavaScript is pretty pretty big. There's JavaScript right there. So they do SQL Server. Visual Studio, IS, ASP.NET, MySQL. Um, I see Postgres on here. Maybe PHP, PHP is huge. C Sharp, JavaScript, Java Query Language. App development for Android and iPhone. I think that's what they were he was talking about in the in his email. So that's probably some of the the technologies that they use. I don't see Postgres on there, but I do see MySQL. And you've been to W3 schools, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got a JavaScript section. Yeah, it's just I got to I got to have the time to do so. I know we're, I'm not we're not physically in class, but man, am I busy outside of that for work? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, sometimes, you know, the company you work for may not use JavaScript. You never, you never know. Sure. Yeah, very true. As you kind of learn, it's not too hard to pick up a new language once you learn one of them. It's a little bit easier as you go along, except, you know, HTML is not really a, a language markup language it's different if you know c sharp that's a language so picking up javascript and python c and different stuff is a little bit quicker once you learn one of them absolutely especially if you have that mindset i like to stick with administration and don't like to get huge into development I actually uh, applied for a uh, systems admin um, online at a company called eSkills. It's a 100% work from home company. And uh, one of my friend's wife's wives work, or well, one of my friends has a wife <laughs> that works there. Um, so she said she can try and push my application on a. Networking is huge. I'm trying to get jobs. <laughs> 